All right, so let's get going. <laughs> uh, okay, this is another uh, tremendous, tremendous uh, pleasure to introduce our closing, our closing speaker. And I, I'm going <laughs> to use a really, really bad pun. Kat Klingenberg is the most active, passive house <laughs> architect. <laughs> She's also the only second German I've ever met with a wicked sense of humor. Ah, man! <laughs> but more importantly, she built the first North American passive house in 2002. Uh, Champaign Urbana and uh, what's so impressive about Passive House US is that it actually recognizes that there are different climate zones in North America. <laughs> we need to let the Germans know that there's air conditioning here. Okay, okay I guess I, I stepped over the line. I, I stepped over the line on that one. Is, is my microphone on yet? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Joe, do you well, want to take over and do this presentation? No, 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 no. <laughs> so please give an incredibly warm welcome to Kat Klingenberg. <laughs> So thank you, Joe. Uh, it's, uh, it's an incredible honor, as always, uh, and always uh, also an incredible challenge, because I don't want to waste any minute at summer camp not camping and not like partying. So uh, please forgive me if I'm a little bit slow. <laughs> um, and Joe kind of like already made all my opening jokes already. I was going to make a disclaimer that uh, don't expect me to be funny, because <laughs> Germans have a, uh, an impairment in that department. Um, but uh, Chris delivered like a summer camp level kind of rebuttal to your meow. She said like you should learn how to spell. <laughs> so I, I figured I'd steal that one. All right. So for those of you who actually look at the agenda, which I never do because I always trust like this is going to be incredible and cool and awesome what I'm going to see, um, I had to uh, change the title as I was preparing the presentation. Um, and as you can see right here, it's become a passive house murder mystery. And um, Joe gave me the assignment to talk about the past, the present, and the future. And of course, not because he's really that interested in what will really happen. He was more interested in like how I would make a fool out of myself, telling you what I think will happen so that he can make fun of me in 10 years time. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I took you serious, and then we'll have some nice predictions for you guys at the end. All right, so um, let's jump right in. Let's see what happens. Um, prologue. <laughs> Past, present, future, prologue, postlogue. I don't know if that exists. So uh, uh, Baby Cat started here, uh, architectural uh, education in Berlin. I moved to Berlin two weeks before the wall came down. Uh, that was a lot of fun. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, definitely change was in the air, so um, that should have told me something. And then I arrived as baby cat again uh, at Ball State University. Like I had no idea, never been on a plane. I'm like, yeah, okay, that sounds like a good idea. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to go and see what's what, what it's like over there. And I bought my favorite uh, transportation mode in. Um, in uh, Muncie, and that's the Cannondale, and I still have it, and I just got it refurbished, and I like, just wanted you to see my bike. It's a lovely bike. And I still had dark hair, too. Um, okay, so uh, I landed at Ball State, and I had absolutely no idea why and how and what. Like, um, a friend of mine got a, a scholarship to go to Iowa uh, State because he wanted to study with Jennifer Bloomer. We spent midsummer night before we both had to fly out in Sweden, and I told him I'm going to go to, to Muncie. <laughs> and he starts laughing. I'm like, what's so funny? He's like, you're a Muncie girl. <laughs> uh, have you not seen Hatsaka Proxy? Um, OK, this is how. It's what? More volume. More volume. Oh, OK. So 
you move my mic up. All right, you move this up. All right. So uh, turns out Muncie is this incredible place. Um, total serendipity. Uh, one of uh, the schools in the United States at the time, who was actually very active in the environmental movement. Uh, Marvin Rosen, Rosenbaum? No, not Baum. But, uh, Marv Rosenman. Um, he was a uh, uh, dean at the time, and like within like um, two months, I found myself in New York City at like one of the early kind of green conferences, and uh, met like a lot of people there who I still still know to this day. And uh, also cool. So uh, I learned only later that they were like really instrumental in this early phase of Passive House, which I would like to call like Passive House 1.0. And um, there's this incredible center there that has all the like uh, experimentations in it, like trom walls and like phase change and like stack effect and all that good stuff. Uh, by the time I got there, it was kind of like already a little bit defunct and people weren't really that much maintaining it and the, the lab was actually kind of empty. But Bob Custer, who runs the Cirrus lab, He's still there. And um, so um, last year, they des um, actually, where's Al? Al decided to, uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, submit for like an alumni award. I got put into the oldest category. I'm not that old yet, but thank you very much. <laughs> 35 years of like outstanding experience. So we go there to accept the award. I took Al with me and he's like, oh yeah, look at this new building right there. Bob Costa and I, we've been running like thermal bridge calculations on that one. I'm like, now I'm starting to put it together how you found us and like how this all kind of like starts to kind of like make sense. I'm like, oh, cool. All right, so a little bit, and then this was the conference that I found myself at in New York City like two months later after I um, came to the United States. All right, so um, after that was, was all said and done, I started working in the US and um, of course I tried to be an architect. At that point I still like, I hadn't really kind of like put one and one together. And what do I do? I hire on with uh, Helmut Jan. And uh, remembered from the good old days in Berlin, like, oh yeah, they were doing these like double wall facade things, like eh, this should be cool. So I ended up being actually on that post tower and that was, that was cool time. And I started to really be interested in energy efficiency. And um, then not much later, uh, somebody came out with a book and they actually measured and um, it was incredible technological feat, of course, uh, lots of moving parts and stuff, very complicated and the savings were only about like 25%. I'm like, this is not going to cut it. So at that point I remembered uh, back in architecture school in Berlin, somebody mentioned something like Passive House and my design uh, architect, whatever uh, professor was like, ah, that stuff's like anti-aesthetic, like forget it, like don't even, don't even think about it. So, but somehow that was still back uh, in the back of my head. So, uh, Passive House uh, 1.0, so it begins. And um, it's taking place in the US, Canada, and Scandinavia, and Scandinavia even before the US and Canada, uh, according to Joe. So Joe and I have had a lot of uh, conversations about this. And Baby Cat had absolutely no clue. And when I started building my house in Urbana, still Baby Cat had no clue. It was kind of embarrassing. I just really wanted to do the right thing and I wanted to build this kind of a house and I wanted to show that it can be done and da da da. No idea that in that little town of Champaign, Urbana, University of Illinois, well, unbeknownst to me, uh, Professor Conzo invented air conditioning like in the, what, like 40s or something and lived in the first air conditioned house in, uh, in the United States on Stoughton Street in Urbana. And then like the building, the Small Homes Council later renamed uh, the Building uh, Research Council had like uh, Professor Conzo start experimenting with the super insulation and the people that I then met when I got there were Bill Rose, Mike McCulley, and they were like, yeah, I saw your article. There was an article about your house in the newspaper. And we're like, eh, been there, done that. Like, I'm like, dude, like, could you please like, why did you not call me? I felt like I was like the lone voice in the wind, right? So I think I ran into Bill Rose here at summer camp at some point, and that's when he told me, like many, many years later, I was like, you gotta be kidding me. So anyway, I'm still doing my thing. <laughs> and uh, so I found all these things out um, in hindsight. 
Uh, after somebody said, like, well, you didn't know that. I'm like, Ugh, oops. So, um, of course, this whole thing starts with, like, 1973, the uh, oil crisis. We already heard about this uh, from Andy. And um, so at that point, I started, like, almost feeling like a detective. I'm, like, going in. I'm like, I want to know how this whole thing came about. So it turns out there was, like, the very first energy standard, um, 97.5, and... Uh, there is a little provision in still the current energy code, and it says um, if you have a peak load of one watt per square foot, you don't have to have a heating system. They let you get away without a heating system. And I've tried to trace everybody down. It's like, can somebody please tell me, like, who put that in there? I even, like, went all the way to, like, uh, uh, New Mexico. I called up Doug Balcom out of the blue. I'm like, Doug, I was wondering, like, somebody said, like, you might actually know who put that in that, like, in, in that first energy code. He's like, no idea, but interesting, interesting question. <laughs> so I kept digging. Uh, and at that point, I started uh, also looking at the, um, the research map of the Department of Energy. Up to that point, I thought, like, oh, the U.S. has no clue about energy efficiency. Like, uh, typical German, right? Like, pff, whatever. Um, <laughs> Turns out, like, all you guys in the room right here, you already had your head straight on, and you had this, like, fantastic research map, like, all mapped out to 2030. You already knew that, like, savings beyond 70% are probably not cost-effective, blah, 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 all that good stuff. So, uh, so here it begins, and I, I'm starting to dig deeper. So this is how I come across the whole, like, debate about, like, super installation versus passive solar. Uh, I find the uh, Larson trusses, where that thing got its name, and it was just, like, a fabulous, like, discovery. I, I had a blast, right? So, um, so we go. Uh, super installation project in Montana. I don't know if it's from there, but you can see, like, that, that was already after I had gotten indoctrinated by, like, the uh, Passive House 2.0. And so I'm, I'm, I'm tracing it back. Where did this all come from? And it looks strangely familiar, right? Like, so in internal heat, solar, all that um, super installation, uh, all that base knowledge already here. I'm like, hmm, interesting. So, and then um, there was this eternal debate. Like, where does this name come from? Everybody's like, oh, yeah, this is a German name, right? This is a German word. So out of the blue, somebody named Rob Dumont sends me an email. I have no idea who Rob Dumont is. I have a nice conversation with him. <laughs> uh, and uh, eventually, he'll send, he'll, he's sending me like all articles about his house. Like he had like a 0.4 air changes per hour in the 70s. And then he says like, well, you know, I have this like paper. And, uh, eventually, I asked him like, do you know where the name Passive House came from? And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like uh, we, we had a whole conference on like Passive Houses in Canada. <laughs> and he sends me this thing from like 1978. And he actually also sent me the research paper. And they are outlining exactly like how well the building has to be insulated to be like heated by solar, what kind of windows. Beautiful, awesome stuff. At some point, somebody really needs to write a book about this. Um, uh, and I, I already have forgotten half of what I found at the time. I should have probably uh, been a little bit better of a documentarian, which I'm not. I'm more like a detective, right? So, OK. So, and then, but the coolest guy I came across was William Shirkliff, and he unfortunately just had passed away. Otherwise, I definitely would have tracked him down. But instead, I tracked down his son, and that was also super interesting, and friends. And so I got all these, like, stories. It was, like, super cool. And um, so, uh, and for those of you who know who he is, he, he was a physicist, and he had a small role in the Oppenheimer. And actually, Al mentioned that. He's like, well, I'm really, really curious. I have to see the Oppenheimer movie because I want to know who, who is playing uh, William Shirkliff in the Oppenheimer movie. So he helped to build the atomic bomb. So when we first learned about Shirkliff, we're like, well, yeah, he has to make, he, he, he's making up for some things, right? So, but the cool thing was then later in his years, he, he was the first one who started to methodologically like collect all this information on the super insulators versus the, the, the passive solar people. And at some point in 88, he had had it. He was like, stop it already. Like, for, for one, super insulation is a stupid name. And I'm going to call this whole thing like passive housing done. And like, it's all about balance. <laughs> 
so, and he was so excited, once he put it together, he put out a press release, and that press release basically had these six points uh, in it, and he was just thrilled. He, he thought that was the newest technology, the, the, the new, next coming in the energy field. But the, 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 the last thing that I will mention here is like, this is uh, the, the, uh, the orange box, this is what he writes. So he, um, this book has two chapters in it, the air to heat exchange, of course, <laughs> and um, the super insulated houses. The super insulated houses part is about the envelope and he describes all the principles. And then he says this at the end and I'm like, okay, this was his prediction that Joe would like to make fun of <laughs> um, in 88. And he says, so uh, more is to be learned about vapor barriers and uh, air and water barriers. He is predicting better air-to-air -air heat exchangers. Uh, he's even predicting the magic box, Alex. <laughs> um, and uh, like our values of windows widely, ava widely available at an R5 to 8. So he nailed it, right? That's exactly what we've done in like Passive House 2.0. So super exciting, I love this stuff. Uh, he also wrote about double envelope houses, but that fell by the wayside because it was a stupid idea. Don't do stupid things. <laughs> So that said, there uh, is another kind of like angle to the double envelope houses and I came across that way later. Uh, somebody shows up on our uh, board, Richard Levine, and at some point he takes me to the site and says like, well, you know, I, I did a few things in my youth too, you know, and um, I, I worked on this building. <laughs> the, uh, he starts telling me the story about the hooker office building and he designed the double envelope for that office building which then was visited by this guy. And he kicked loose this whole like trend in Europe of the double envelope houses, right? Like people started to experiment with that stuff. So I just thought it was just like too cool that like people were, they kept coming out of the woodworks and I learned what people had already done in, in, in the lives before me. So anyway, so Passive House 2.0. Now, this is where the murder mystery, the plot thickens, right? Yeah. So, um, the way I learned about Passive House was Passive House in Germany in architecture school. And again, the aestheticists, they would like be totally appalled, like, yeah, forget it. But then uh, various crises happened in my life and like in the world, and I decided, okay, uh, this is it, I have to build my own house this way. Uh, hell, or, uh, high water, I, I'm going to do this. Quit my job, decided like I'm never ever going to build anything but passive houses, that was it for me. <laughs> little, little extreme. And um, so this is my house in the upper right hand corner right there. And uh, that was before I knew that the uh, Small Homes Council, later Building Research Council had already uh, pioneered all this and that those houses were on the ground, it was actually, people think they were never built, but young builder, Mike McCulley, <laughs> at the time an intern, uh, I believe, or a young staff member at the council, decided, I'm going to build these things. <laughs> so he built, like, I think three of them, and I got to see all of them on, like, one of our tours, and they are all still kicking ass. And when they go on the market, they sell, like, in a second. So very cool stuff. We have long-term experience with this. Uh, then, of course, there is the uh, much-described Saskatchewan house. Harold Orr uh, always gets a lot of credit for that, but in conversations with uh, Joe, he's like, oh, no, 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 it was actually really Rob Dumont who kind of kept like the naysayers away from like uh, Harold Orr, and then Harold could go into the ditch and build this, like, whatever, like, wood foundation and stuff. And, uh, okay. Um, and, and Harold is a great guy. He became a good friend. Like, so a couple years ago when the Hurricane Ian hit, I was walking the streets of Chicago, my phone rings. I'm like, huh, Harold? <laughs> Harold felt the need to call me and to say like, oh, this thing that just happened in Florida, you, you have to do something. Like, we need to rebuild all these houses the right way. I'm like, Harold, that's really nice that you think that I could do anything about this, but this is America and it's just me, you know? <laughs> So anyway, so it's just like really, really cool how like all this unraveled and how I came across people. And then of course there's the, uh, the German contingency. And um, as I started to tell the story, so there's this funny one, one watt uh, provision in the energy code still to this day. You can build a house without a heating system. If you want, it, if you want to, you just have to prove that you have a one watt per square foot 
peak load. And those of you who are coming to summer camp a long time, you might remember Chris's and Henry's um, presentation on the perfect energy code. Like, what if we just like specify peak loads? Exactly that, right? So, um, so this is where the plot thickens. The Germans, the Germans, like Dr. Feist, I was actually personally trained by him. He learned about my house and he said like, well, we think we should translate this enormous spreadsheet in the English, into the English language and maybe even like at some point into IP units uh, and you have already done all this work, would you, would you help me to do that? So I got to actually intern there and I started the translation, the very first one uh, of the PHPP into the English language, which was a monster. I, 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 I learned so much. Um, but I learned from Dr. Feist that all this had already happened in the United States and he's like, you didn't know that? And then he goes and pulls this book off of his shelf and says like, Small Homes Council, like Urbana, right here. I'm like, ah, oh, okay. Um, so of course I went back home and I started digging. Um, so, but the cool thing is like, these are all interrelated, right? So he picked up on the one watt per square meter no, one, one watt per, per square foot or 10, 10 watts per square meter peak load. And that's where he started. He's like, this is great. We're going to build an envelope in the Central European, like in, in Frankfurt, we're going to build that house that has a one watt per square foot peak load, 10 watts per square meter. So they, they went ahead and did it. Happened to match exactly the 10 factor 10 reduction that the agenda 21 specified, like earlier in the 80s, during the uh, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. So the Germans were like, all right, this is, a, this is a good research product. If we can do that, then we can sell to the German government that we can actually build energy efficient houses and it, it, it makes sense. So they, they did it and they came up with a set of like criteria. Then they found out um, that um, actually nobody understood what peak lows was. <laughs> and they're like, okay, um, let's just like calculate annual and that's gonna be our target. 15 kilowatt hours, no, sorry, 15 kilowatt hours per square meter in year or 4.75 per square foot in year. So this is where all this came about uh, and how it came about. So it, it was an incredible amount of fun to kind of like trace all this back. Okay, so uh, while I'm learning all this stuff, I'm building my own house and damn it, did I have sleepless nights, like nightmares are nothing. Uh, that damn moisture thing, I. And I thought I was completely insane. Like people would come, like, like Betsy, like the neighbor would come and was like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, oh yeah, maybe I was stupid. Maybe I should have just like built a house like with less insulation, put a heat pump in it. Um, uh, at the time, everybody was talking about ground source heat pumps. Um, once I had the house, it was like, holy shit. It was like a, it was like a revelation, right? It was like, it, it turned everything upside down. Best house on the planet. Um, in, for me, in my book. But you can see I was experimenting with these walls right here and I, I was like so aware of the hydrothermal stuff and I was aware that I was like moving things around into different climates and like I, I made plenty of mistakes. And um, so, but that was the first attempt right here. And yeah, I still had like 16 inches of foam under the slab, insane, would never do that again. Uh, but a good experiment and it indeed works like when the power goes out like that thing doesn't go anywhere it's, it's comfy like uh, we have blizzards in uh, Illinois no problem what happens after a blizzard sun shines whoops uh, toasty I'm walking around in my t-shirt and it's like negative 40 wind chill outside <laughs> so so that part really worked well uh, we'll talk about cooling and dehumidification next um, so while I'm learning this, uh, I go over to the European conferences, I look at like what they are doing over there, and one of the presenters had a slide like this, like building science, and everybody was like really worried. They, they started to wrap their heads around this whole like climate thing, like we have to do something, and, and, and people were kind of just depressed, right? Um, so, but um, the presenter said like, well, you know, like it might look kind of dismal, but building science is our safety rope up the, up the mountain. And um, it's probably not the best slide because this is pretty daring right here, but uh, I've really come to appreciate building science as exactly that. But I have to also admit that at the time I was so insecure and I, I was so like um, threatened by this 
whole like fossil fuel climate whatever thing uh, that I was really clinging tightly to this rope and to those guidelines that were given to me as kind of almost God-given. That, that was before I knew where all this came from. Um, so, yeah, in 2005, the CEO at the time of Shell was very forward-thinking. Uh, I don't know if you remember this. There was a time when there were PV panels on all Shell stations. They disappeared again. But that was under this guy. And this guy was fully aware if our population continues to grow and we want to vest like the other continents that are still like not having electricity to this day for many people, if we want to make this a reality for everyone, we need efficiency. There is no way around it. There is not enough other alternative there. there. <laughs> so that, that, that was the thing that I came away with. And then um, we built a couple of, oh, no, 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 hold on, hold on. Very important moment in time. Uh, I'm sitting, I'm minding my own business, designing passive houses for affordable people, like in uh, Champaign-Urbana, phone rings. And uh, my intern says, like, there's a woman who keeps calling, and like, you really have to call her back. I'm like, no, it's, I don't care, I'm busy, go away. Um, and then one day, Chris actually uh, managed to have me in the office and pick up the phone. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> Boston? What? Where? Um, and she's like, you have to come to Boston, to Nessie. And that was in 2006, and the rest is kind of almost history. So then she put me in a session with Mark. That was my like, introduction to this community. And I got my butt handed to myself. So Mark is like, why 15? Hmm. I'm like, uh, I don't know. I just, I just did this. I used this. So I'm like, OK, I'm starting to get the lay of land here. And then the second session that Chris put me on it, and probably fully knowing what she was kind of like, which shark tank she was throwing me into, <laughs> um, there is Betsy uh, is sitting there at, uh, on a panel, and John Straub, and then little me, and some other guy from the Passive Institute. And then, of course, Henry is in the audience, and starts like walking halfway through the presentation, like in front of uh, like us, like the, the people from Europe who had no idea about cooling and dehumidification, is like starting to point to psychometric chart t-shirt, right? And then Betsy's like, you can't do that. Like, these, these houses will melt away. And John Straub's like, oh, this is crap. Like, 20, 40, 60, we have done 50,000 houses. You have done one. <laughs> like, ugh, where am I? So uh, anyway, um, I've gone to Nessie, like, to every single presentation since. Uh, and uh, these guys have adop adopted me. I'm like, thank you, thank you. It's, it, it is an absolute honor. And we were talking about it, like, and now I'm just, I guess I'm the old guy. I get more than 30 minutes at summer camp. Um, <laughs> so now it's our turn to adopt the youngins. Uh, so thank you for adopting me, Betsy, Joe, uh, Chris, Mark. There are so many more in this group who, along the way, kind of helped me along. So anyway, we, we kept building these affordable houses and we tried to beat the cost barrier because that turned out to be the biggest problem. We, eventually we got the building science down, we got, all, we got the energy down, but this cost thing, that was really, really a bummer. Yeah? So um, tried the TJI upright bearing wall first and with foam on the outside, uh, tried the Larson truss. This, this was one of our last ones here. We went to like basically a regular uh, stud wall. I think it was a I can't, might have been only like a two by four, but it might have been a two by six. And then a, a nine and a half uh, TGI, like hanging off of the regular stud wall. And then we also started to experiment with float foundations and uh, we, we cut those in the shop. So it's basically like, it's just a plug and play. You stick that like edge thing in and because the pressure pushes it, it doesn't go anywhere. Um, so we started like chipping away on the costs and trying to figure this out. And then um, we started like experimenting with projects in different climate zones. And this is when like the rails came off. Uh, no, no how did the, whatever, train jumped the rails. Up. Sorry. <laughs> um, and I, I looked at like what happened at my house. So dutifully I had put in an earth tube. I'm like, oh wait, I'm gonna do this. I was told in Europe, yeah, yeah, no, condensation, no, we have never, never really seen any condensation in, in the earth tubes that we've done in Germany. Like, okay, cool. Um, went, bought an earth tube, eight inches, like 100 feet long. Uh, first, someone starts gurgling. I'm like, 
what is the Google noise? <laughs> I go to my cleaner and I look like, oh shoot. <laughs> that thing was completely full, full with water. And it was the most nicest, cleanest water. And in Urbana, I don't know if you know this, we're in swampland. I couldn't put in like a, a drain and a rock bed so that that thing, and it was six feet deep. So I had to pump all this water, it was beautiful water. So I'm, I'm still thinking like, I'm gonna reuse that earth tube, Joe. I did not fill it with concrete. I'm gonna make water. You know, I don't know if you know this, but we're having droughts and stuff. Um, all right, so lesson learned, uh-uh, no good. Um, then next lesson learned, like, yeah, damn, it was really damn hot. And I'm like, no, I'm going to do this passive, 10% overheating. I can do this. Uh, no. Uh, really damn freaking hot. So in the summer, not cool. I have uh, essentially the first generation uh, magic box, the CERV, uh, built by Ty Newell, who has a shop two miles from my house. Again, another of the early pioneers who has been doing all this kind of stuff. And um, I do need cooling. I don't need a lot because I, I'm okay with like 82 degrees, but uh, when it climbed up to almost 100 degrees, even I had it. And that was before I had dehumidification. It, I mean, and as you know, on the psychometric chart, there should be a section that should be red, like death zone, right? <laughs> Can't believe that they don't tell anyone that. Um, so I, I feel like I got pretty close to the death zone. Um, it's actually dangerous. Hello. Um, and even in the winter, it overheated, like the proverbial negative 40 blizzard, and I'm running around in a t-shirt, I'm like, I can't take anything else off, I have to open the window, which is okay in the winter, right? So then we got a Louisiana project, and that really was when the wheel, wheels fell off. Um, and who are you gonna call, call when things go awry? Henry Gifford. I remember that presentation where he was walking around in front of me with his plecometric chart, and they couldn't get the uh, humidity under control in the Louisiana house. The envelope was fine, we had all that figured out, but the mini split wasn't even anywhere close to be able to, 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 to cover that. We, we learned a few things. Uh, dehumidification, point, point dehumidification does not work. You have to kind of like, you, you have to duct it. Um, the other thing is like, because we crushed the loads, now, we learned about the, uh, the uh, sensible heating ratio, right? Um, in passive houses, way too close. Like, the systems that we have, they, we need additional dehumidification. We learned that the hard way. And Henry uh, was trying to coach people through, like, different solutions, and none of them worked. And we were like, damn it, what are we going to do? So that was our first rodeo with uh, a, a cooling-dominated and dehumidification-dominated climate applying passive principles. All right, so similar things happened. California used, again, this like one size fits all. It was like building a cow's fence around a bunch of chickens. Um, like we used a design criteria and that was completely meaningless in California because eh. Uh, so uh, if you used that criterion, you were essentially doing nothing. <laughs> so it was really easy to meet those German criteria in, in California. And um, we're like, wait a minute, this can't be right. So a whole bunch of savings were actually left on the table if we had immediately already thought of like cost optimization and um, optimization by climate, we would have had it, right? But we didn't have the right, de right design criteria. So, and the stories go, go, go on. Edmund in Canada uh, had all, all of a sudden like a giant cooling load in a climate where there really shouldn't be any. So we, we learned all this um, and, and the, Modeling tool was off consistently by 25 to 30 percent. We had the inconvenient habit to measure things. So, so all these tools come like as we started looking at it in reality and 3D, they kind of were off. And there was the need to fix. And there was no consideration given to hydrothermal performance. Like when people started taking like the co uh, cold climate wall and transported it one to one to Louisiana, that's when I had real nightmares. I'm like, okay, I am like be, I'm, I'm seen as kind of like the representative. I am putting people at risk. And luckily our Louisiana client was forgiving enough. He, I had told him like, we've never done this before. This can totally backfire. And he was like, I want to do it. I'm like, okay, but that's on you. <laughs> So, and it backfired, right? But we learned a lot. So, um, during that fateful year, oh no, um, 
that was a fateful year too. <laughs> All right, let's go there first. The fateful year comes next. So, um, actually, that's a little bit out of order. Uh, I do have to talk about the fateful year first. Uh, the first fateful year, uh, 2011. 2011, me and my board, FIERS, Passive House Institute US already existed. We went over to Innsbruck to talk to Dr. Feist and to say, we're sorry, but we implemented this in different climate zones, but we think it's really not where it should be. We, we would like to work with you to fix this. Like, we, we have a few ideas how you could do this. And they basically told us, nope, this is the only answer, this is it. Uh, you can either continue working with us or not. If not, they, they, they literally pointed to the door and there's a board member of FIES here in the room who was in this fateful meeting, Prudence, over there. Uh, she can tell you that I, I'm not making this up. So we went home, we uh, felt heartbroken because, you know, this like murder mystery thing, there's a love story in there too and a family drama, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, but we decided like it's our responsibility. We cannot do this. We cannot continue to promote this. And we wrote a letter, very polite. It was a pleasure working with you. Next thing we knew, we got ambushed, like <laughs> by a letter saying like all the horrible things that we had, we had done. So anyway, uh, wounds heal and we move on and we did the work that we were supposed to work on in the first place. So at that point, uh, I was invited by Betsy to come to summer camp. And man, was that a revelation. A uh, Couple things came out of that one. Um, I met Joe, of course. I also met Oliver Drarup. Fabulous person. I can't believe why he's not coming back. I've tried to rope him in multiple times. Like, are you going to keynote our conference now? Are you, do you feel old enough, wise enough yet? He's like, no, 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 I stay put. I'm in Canada and I say, I'm not going anywhere. But he took me under his wing during this fateful summer camp and uh, I got more information. Like, Rob Dumont and like all the Canadians, like the total inside scoop. And I learned that he was one of them too. And he said, like, if you don't know your history, uh, your past, you do not have a future. And I took that very, very serious. So hence this presentation. Um, and then, of course, this is young Joe. Um, I invited him to keynote our conference in Denver that year. And I had no idea what was coming. This was another one of these aha moments. First of all, he's late because he experimented a little too late the night before. Um, <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, he's going to stand us up. <laughs> he's not even going to show. Of course, like five minutes after the time, he waltzes in. It's like, all right, like getting settled. And then he goes into this like incredible presentation. I'm like, I mean, I, I literally almost fell out of my seat. These were all the same details that I had just like labored over and like had like sleepless nights and everything. Like this dude did already do this and like when he was 21. And then I found a footnote in one of the uh, Shercliffe papers where he actually refers to young Joseph and he, he could have not been more than like 21 years old. And you're being referenced by William Shercliffe. So anyway. Good stuff. Um, and then, of course, also somehow I come across Amory Levins. Um, and he was our closing keynote speaker at that conference. And he said, if you guys have a solution for passive house for different climates, you rule them all. <laughs> That's essentially what he said. Like, and then he showed a map. And he showed the US climate zones and he compared them to China's climate zones. He's like, you got almost all the climate zones in the US. If you have an answer for all of those, and you didn't say you rule them all. Like, you get the point, right? Like, we have solutions for everything, everywhere. So that was an incredible, piv incredibly pivotal moment. Uh, and that takes us to Passive House 3.0. All right, Passive House 3.0, modern day passive building, I like to call it, because we need to ditch this Passive House term. <laughs> It does not work for big buildings. Like seriously, really passive house building? Who came up with this kakamimia thing? Like, yeah, uh, house means building? No, it doesn't. <laughs> uh, a house is a building, but a building is not a house. See how that goes? Um, so we need to stop that. Let's go back to the roots. Own this as a community. We did this. 
and, and call it what it is, passive building. And it is appropriate for everything. And I would even go so far to say environmental building technology, back to my title, right? Like, we, we, can, we can now throw off the training wheels. We were starting to, we, we learned the notes, so we can now just like play the music. <laughs> um, so I, I feel like that's really the point where, where we're at right now. Which is really cool and good news, it's awesome. So this is a little bit of a convoluted slide, but I thought it might help to see where these pivotal moments uh, happened. Uh, we started actually as a community housing developer. So this is where, and we're a nonprofit. So this is where my heart is. Um, and this is why, well, I was also lucky. I was able to avoid the conflict that inherently exists between business and, um, and providing a service, right? So we can afford, we, we get money from over here and we do something else with it over there because the government doesn't have the capacity or doesn't want to do it. But we're, we're not bound by the market forces. This is our mission. We want to transform the market. So um, it's nice to have that freedom. We, we don't have that constraint. Um, but so it's a little bit of a convoluted uh, history here. There was Equilab first, and then came Passive House Institute LLC. It started out as a for-profit, turned itself into a non-profit for, for obvious reasons. Um, there were intersections with the University of Illinois. We, I was actually teaching the students in 2009. Uh, you might remember this, Solar Decathlon. Uh, the year before, the Germans had won, and we're like, damn it, we can do this too. <laughs> so uh, Mike McCauley hired me, actually, to train the students, and we went to town. And if the Germans hadn't like, covered their entire damn cube in PV, we, we, we were behind them by 10 points and we won all the energy efficiency uh, races like hands down. Theirs cost a million, ours cost 250K. And we were way over producing. So, and that was 2009. And one of the student leads on this one is now one of our like, most stellar uh, CPHCs. He lives in St. Louis and teaches at WashU. <laughs> Rockstar. So, um, and then another fateful moment, Achilles, is Achilles still here or did he head out already? I saw him wheel around, no, there he is. So Achilles was another pain in my, so <laughs> he basically put the, put the gun on my chest and said like, if you're not doing this with me, then I'm doing it by myself. <laughs> so uh, what he's talking about is like, he's like, we need to create Wolfie Passive. And I'm like, uh, what do you mean? Like, new modeling tool? Like, Wait, like, I'd, who, who are these Fraunhofer people? <laughs> so anyway, rest is history. Ever since, uh, under like uh, Achilles' leadership, we worked with the Stella team from Fraunhofer on creating the next gen modeling tool, which is about to jump into the next next gen. Uh, we've been talking about it and teasing you forever. Like there is a new Wolfie passive coming in the cloud. We're this close. All right, so before the year is over, you're gonna see this new tool in the cloud. So, at least I think, I don't know. <laughs> um, then in 2012, we're like, okay, we need to align with the Department of Energy. I remember this like um, research plan that the Department of, of Energy already had. I met Sam Rashkin and proposed like we should like build our programs together. He's like, oh, great idea. Um, I believe in the stepping stone process. I'll take people to where we think the uh, cost optimal point is and then we point to you because that's where we really want to be by 2030. And that's how the codes have kind of like, they, they over time, they have like slowly kind of like uh, encroached upon us. So this decision, that was my best decision in my entire life. Like, okay, Sam, let's, let's do this. Uh, that made the difference in, in the world. Like, uh, we um, partnered with ResNet because what we also learned was quality assurance, continual commissioning. Without it, no, no. This is what, what we do, this is engineering, right? Like the moment like you drive the car off of the lot, like the thing starts to go out of commission. It's the same thing with a building. So, but nobody ever really goes back and recommissions the building. So if we really want to see the carbon savings that we planned for and that we, that we designed and wanted um, and that we need, then we really need to be diligent. We need to do that too. So now we're completely aligned with the entire suite of tools. You saw the uh, building science advisor this morning. Um, great, absolutely fantastic working relationship. Eric Whirling, where is Eric? Uh, rock stars, all of them. There, there he is in the back. 
troublemaker in the back row, right next to Joe. Um, all right, and then in 2021, we decided, okay, time to ditch Passive House. We're no longer the Passive House Institute US, we are fierce, fierce like Prius. We want to revolutionize the building industry like what the Prius did to the car industry, right? Like, okay, somebody said like, oh, but that's Tesla. I'm like, well, do you have any idea how long it took to get the market along and to get there? That's, that's, that's what we're talking here. We're talking market transformation. All right, so uh, what do we do at Fierce? And I probably need to speed up. Um, we do all these things. Um, we train people and certify them. Uh, we certify products so that it's easier for the people to specify and faster to model buildings to this level of efficiency. We develop software, who knew? Um, we have building certifications, paving the path to zero, right? We're no longer stuck just on this like envelope piece. That was an okay place to be when solar wasn't affordable yet. But now we've, we've shown like we can do zero energy buildings like hands down, we absolutely can. And, and we got into the standard setting business. So when Joe says I'm his favorite third, fifth, I don't know, however many architects you know, but um, so I don't do that stuff anymore. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sad about it sometimes, but I know how important good standard setting is because I've been there. <laughs> if you don't have the right targets, you will be making uninformed decisions. So. What happens is like, it's so important, and Mark started this actually on Monday. He started us off with that. Like, why bother? What problem am I trying to solve here? So our tools we make for a certain purpose. <laughs> and we need to be aware of where we're setting these boundaries, because otherwise, if we're not, then we're making tools that we might take out of context, and then we, we create nonsensical stuff. Um, and the more we're trying to tackle this whole carbon thing, we need to be really careful and, and aware that of the complexity and we need to draw the right boundaries to get the right answers or we're racing in the wrong direction. So um, that's, that's what we've come to learn and Graham Wright, uh, genius, thank you. Um, <laughs> And for that matter, the entire team uh, that is sitting over there. Uh, but uh, when I told Graham, like, I don't know when it was, like pff, 2011, like, you know what? I think we need to totally rethink the, the standards framework. Uh, there are a couple of really good things that the Germans did here and we can learn from, but we really need to fix this. What do you think about a climate specific standard and how can we get there? And with Betsy's and Joe's help, they believed in us after this fateful moment of the first summer camp and they said, we have this grant. Why don't you develop this? Because we needed money. So they, they backed us, like Rob Dumont backed like Harold Orr in the, whenever that was. And, um, and we were able to write this, this first passive building, climate specific passive building standard. Uh, it got peer reviewed. We've built countless projects since then, measured, it works. So that's how standard setting should be. You should not just concoct something and then unleash it into the market without A, peer review, and B, without testing. Are you nuts? The consequences are way too severe. So what a warning. This is not for the faint of heart, the standard setting. So Graham, thank you. You, you did a fantastic job and he keeps doing it. Okay, so um, rebranding, FIAS, no longer the, now the word, no longer the uh, acronym, and zero is our goal. And uh, we're translating our tech talk. Very hard for me. It's like uh, our marketing consultant. I think uh, I was their hardest case. I'm like, uh, they, were, they were the people who said like, if you say air change one more time. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, okay. Okay, you, you write stuff now from now on. I'll, I'll, I'll shut up. So anyway, that was that exercise. And uh, with that exercise comes like, putting it into simple terms that people can understand, right? We have been talking about, Betsy has been talking about it. How, how can we, now that we feel pretty confident that we have the answer, how can we now push it out into the market and teach people like, hey, this is really something you want. You will want to want really once I make my predictions for the next 10 years. Um, so if you do this right, like you get all these benefits and it's a win-win for everyone. So 
Um, the five principles, I'm sure you like, uh, have seen those, like whatever installation, thermal bridge free, airtight, uh, heat recovery, solar, appropriate climate appropriate glazing. There's a whole other half to this. This is like uh, the, the, the dynamic part. That would be like interactions with, with HVAC systems, hygrothermal, thermal mass, all that stuff. That's not even here yet. So what you see right here, this is like what we could call like the core passive principles. And they have been in existence since like the first people started it in the, in the US, Canada, and in, uh, and in Scandinavia for that matter. They are building science principles. They are not passive house. Very simple. What we think we know is passive house. So often people are like, what is passive house? And then they list these things. Like, yeah, that's, that's the science. Those are the principles. But what we think what we're explaining is the design methodology. And this is like where we briefly go back to the Germans. They, they did this really, really well, but only for one climate, for one building typology, for one cost structure. Remember, that's very specific. One end townhouse in a, the simplest climate you can find, the one that only has heating, no cooling, no dehumidification, de and in a cost structure where they have hydronic heating. It was really easy for them to justify a whole bunch of extra insulation because they could get rid of a really, really expensive heating system. And of course, the climate was so mild, they even could do the Amory Levins thing, tunneling through the cost barrier, like stick a little heat into the, ventil into the uh, ventilation system, and it works over there. Well, if you do really well. Okay, so, um, but now to the secret sauce of passive, really. And that is like what Lisa White has been working on and talked to you about last year, the whole idea of the microgrid. Now, we're drawing the boundary now outside of the building. Like, what happens? Can we get to more synergies? If we actually say, like, what if we designed a whole city block? And what if we added a microgrid? And what if we tapped into demand response? And uh, load shifting, and maybe we can revisit thermal mass. Maybe now we understand, and now we can even squeeze a little bit more out of the passive, which we all love, out of that one. So the key here is peak reduction. And now I'm, I'm stressing this because this is really a key to survival. <laughs> because this whole like electrification now and no efficiency, uh, we can arg have arguments over carbon and whatever, like I don't think any of the tools are close enough that anybody can claim that this is accurate, except of course Skylar. <laughs> but anyway, uh, but the big real problem here is, and uh, there's a report coming through AIA that Lisa and um, Walter Gronzek wrote, a design guide for architects how to uh, design a microgrid with fierce level uh, efficiencies at its core. So. If we don't do any of that stuff, um, we'll need a grid that is 10 times as big uh, than what we have already. Well, it doesn't work. We, we can't. We, we are working so frantically on all ends like, of the system. We're trying to decarbonize the, build, the, 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 the grid. We're trying to decarbonize buildings, like our existing buildings. Every, everything is on fire, right? So what we really need is like big, broad, like reduction goals and we need to stick to them. So briefly back to the certification framework because this is really important. Um, space conditioning targets, not just one, not just heating, hello. Like heating and cooling is a balancing act, right? We need one for heating demand and one for cooling demand because the, the annual consumption tells us how much energy we save and how much payback we get. Money matters. Um, peak loads, we need the peak loads. I just showed it, like we need to crush the peak loads so that we can um, keep our grid small as we electrify, um, and other good things that come with that. The grid doesn't collapse and like no brownouts. Uh, we need air tightness for the hydrothermal purposes. Yes, it's also great for efficiency, but we need it to not rot our buildings out. If we add insulation, things become more difficult. It's true. We need to do the, and we need to know what we're doing. Otherwise, we're destroying our building stock. Uh, and then we need on-site quality assurance and um, commissioning to assure that we actually get those savings that we need so badly, right? We're, we're racing towards absolute zero. We need absolute zero in our system. All right, so um, I already talked about that, like our partnership with um, 
Sam Rashkin, Energy Star, and Zero Energy Ready Home here. Uh, very important. So we didn't uh, stop at climate-specific passive building standards. As more and more large building developers came to us and said, like, well, we want to build large multifamily buildings, like 300 units. We're like, okay. Um, and it took three iterations of the standard fixing, thank you, Graham, for the data, um, <laughs> to get it right. But building size matters. And then we also learned occupant density matters. And we had to build all these things into our calculators to come up with our four targets that you need to design correctly. So sweet spot, cost, climate, and building typology. And we have these handy dandy calculators that tell you what you need for your building design. And you can see right here, it's not just one number. It's not like one size fits all. And um, as you change your inputs in terms of like building size, these numbers change. Um, so you can see right here, uh, really the important numbers, I, I can't really point to this, but is really the, the, the second to last box there. We have the heating demand, cooling demand, peak heating load, peak cooling load, and all those numbers change. And we've done some massive modeling for like optimizing all these individual cases. So yeah, we, we live in an age where we can actually get like really powerful computers to calculate those sweet spots for us. Okay, design certification, yes, we still use Woofy, I already talked about that. And we did measure, this is already an old slide, but this is pretty damn good. Like we are on average like within 7%, I really want to better this, I want to get better. I want to, I, at one day I really want to be able to say like, yeah, our modeling tool is so accurate with our commissioning and our processes for quality assurance, we're within 3%. I remember Michael Blasnick's presentation from a while back. He's like, all modeling tools are crap. And I rather do my energy model on the back of an envelope and that's good enough. I'm like, Okay, um, I, I think, I really do think we have some super smart people, uh, computer programmers, we can make tools that get us much closer. And now we have projects on the ground. So now we're getting to Massachusetts and what's happening here. Um, it works, we're hitting our targets. So 63% reduction is pretty awesome. Um, certifications, we have them for all different varieties, uh, commercial, uh, residential, for new construction and for retrofit. We have built-in provisions for electrification, so we're trying to guide the market towards like, if you do gas, plan for like a, a fuel transition, like make your, your panel big enough. Like in the future, you, you already know the, the BEPs, right? The building energy, uh, the building performance standards that a lot of cities are starting to put in place, people are going to get fined if they don't reduce their energy consumption. So if you build a new building today and you don't think ahead, that's not going to be ending well. Um, so you will be forced to fuel switch probably in the near future. And then again here from Lisa's work, we're working on another certification that now looks at the entire community to squeeze even more like efficiency out of the system. So now we're drawing the boundary wider than the building itself. We're drawing it out into the grid. Um, and this very elegantly solves the duck, duck curve, right? Like we're teaching the duck to fly. <laughs> so all good stuff. And uh, Lisa was so kind to provide this one slide to me. Um, this is from the new report that I mentioned, the AIA microgrid design report. And it shows like the whole picture from the cost side. Do the energy efficiency of that do that. <laughs> and, uh, even current code, right? Like we're still like significantly better. All right. Uh, latest and greatest revive. Uh, there was discussion about carbon and operational. Yes, we need to optimize not only for the uh, things that are already, were already mentioned, but for carbon as well. And uh, there's this argument. Like if we upgrade our entire building stock, we kick the planet in the butt with carbon, right? Uh, because we, we will, we're planning on doing this during a, an incredible short time frame, and if we pump all that carbon into the atmosphere, oops. So um, there is a real need to reduce the upfront embodied carbon. We can do this multiple ways. We can choose better materials, as Betsy like pointed out, but we also can get better at standard setting, and that's what Graham is working on right now. So basically, the challenge is how far can we reduce the 
um, efficiency in our retrofitted existing buildings without losing the benefits of resilience. Because there's this other thing. We're in the middle of climate change. And we're, we need adaptation. And our buildings need to be safe. It's not going to be pretty. So we, th that's the last thing we want to give up, that, that is resilience. And again, Betsy pointed to that. She built her house for resilience for her daughter. We all need a resilient home. So that's what Graham is working on. I'm not even going to try to explain this. Um, because this is not my forte. Um, but just really quick, I was really happy to see that uh, PNNL put out a study where they actually acknowledged, they took our standards and they validated them in countless models, and they, <laughs> they calculated how many lives are saved if fears was the baseline and not code. So uh, it's 3.6 versus 8.6 people. And also I thought it was interesting, their study case was in Atlanta. Huh in a heating-dominated climate. Well, I think the uh, cold spills in Texas have taught everybody quite a lesson. What's to come, right? So, especially along the coast. Right, here you go. So, and these are more from the revived kind of like research and the thinking behind it. Um, probably too much experiments with alcohol last night. Again, talk to the team <laughs> if you want details. But there's uh, essentially an attempt to use cost as a proxy for carbon. And in absence of really much more precise carbon calculators, maybe that's the way to go. So that's what uh, we're trying to, to put together here. And the cool thing, and Al has done a tremendous work, uh, uh, work on this one, he has put together a modeling tool that then optimizes for the upgrades. These are different packages. So the FIAS prescriptive package is the best on the bottom there for Chicago if you wanted to retrofit. Um, so that is using this uh, ad hoc calculation, help me out. Uh, what, what does it stand for? Thank you. Okay, awesome, yes. That's exactly what we're, what we're after, and if that works for retrofit construction, maybe we'll do this for new too, because same problem, right? All right, uh, this is a very cool thing for those of you who are materials geeks. Uh, Laura was saying, Kat will tell you all about like triple pane windows. Yeah, no, way beyond that. So um, we now have a really nifty like uh, window database uh, with over 40 windows certified, and it makes it easy for the consumer, for the architect, for the builder, we have rated them by climate zone. So, hey, this window is good over here, and this window is good over there. And it's uh, in metric and in um, imperial, so you can toggle. So it's pretty cool. Um, uptake, crazy, in the northeast. Now we're coming to Massachusetts. Uh, we had a little bit of a dent in, um, got to check time. Okay, oh, I'm good. Sorry, I'm racing through this. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just a lot of information. But you can see right here that um, definitely COVID put a bit in, uh, of a dent in our um, like exponential growth curve here. But we rebounded much stronger than before COVID. So uh, projects are growing quickly. We are growing quickly. I think we are now going like towards almost 30 people with all the interns. I can't keep up. Um, so, so things are afoot. Uh, whatever we did, uh, it must have worked. Um, and these are the stats. Uh, multifamily is the largest growing building typology, and they are really, really big ones. All right. And then, of course, there's training. So as people around the country are looking at, like, should we incentivize this, or like an alternative compliance path, and, and our mission as a nonprofit is to make passive building mainstream. We want everything and everybody to do everything with this. Um, the next biggest problem is like, where are the trades? Who can do that? Like, we need to teach them the notes, and then they need to be able to forget them, and not having to think like every time, like, oh my God, am I going to make a mistake if I drill a hole into this? You know, so. The trades are going to be key to success. We need to really scale up our trades trainings and, and architects. All right, now the interesting part. 
Joe, I'm going to try to slow down now. This, this was the not so interesting part. This is like, this is all the stuff that we work on. But the impact and the future, that's the interesting part. All right. Um, as I said, our mission is to make this code everywhere for everything. And the zero code, I, I know it's probably already outdated, but um, Architecture 2030 came out with a zero code and they basically just select, well, ASHRAE baseline and then you put PV on it or decarbonize the, the grid. We say this is really how it should look like. And really ultimately with the goal to get to absolute zero with everything. And whatever we did, like in trying to build the supply chain, it has been very successful. So the cool thing is for single family homes, initially we, it was almost all single family. Now, as I mentioned, we're moving into multifamily. Um, but the single family homes, what makes them so cool is like it's so easy to get to zero. <laughs> and you have a better building, and it is so easy to power your car. Um, in 2018, I put a PV system on my house, uh, finally. I had given myself until 2030 to get there, and finally in 2018, I'm like, damn it, I want a house that is, I want to take this off of the carbon bill of the planet, put the thing on, a uh, 5.7 kW system gives me 10,000 electric car miles at my house. Okay, granted, it's not big, right? Uh, it's like a little bit bigger version of the tiny homes. It's a thousand square foot home with like two bedrooms, but hey, maybe we need to shrink a little too. So, but that said, people have, have, they're building these homes all over the country in all different climate zones and they are beautiful. The architects are finally kind of getting the hang of it. You can see here there are a couple of really cool looking ones. It's, it's just fun. We have, we have design competitions now every year for a conference and the projects are getting better and better. It's just like people are really starting to kind of express that new quality of life. It's like I, I see some, some happiness coming out of these projects and it's, it's incredibly gratifying. So that said, multifamily is next and the big frontier. And the good news here is multifamily is so easy. OMG. So what did we learn when we looked at like climate specific uh, standards and building typology? What do you think happens to a multifamily building? Do you still have like a wall like this? Nope. It's a little bit more than code. Guess what? Not that expensive. If you know the secret sauce, how to get to air tightness and if the architect knows what he or she is designing. So um, we had incredible help from policymakers we've been working with. And this stuff does not happen overnight, okay? Um, Paul Eldrenkamp and I had a meeting with Ian Finlayson in 2009 after the Nessie conference. And that was the first time when we started like, okay, how can we get this into the stretch code? Like, how should we go about this? And how, how should this be done? So he has been working on this forever. And finally, after uh, Massachusetts basically said like, yeah, we're gonna give this a shot and the Mass Clean Energy Center competition. And they said, let's, let's build a couple of these, measure, monitor, and then we'll see how this goes. So they picked, I believe, eight projects. They were all fierce projects, so cost optimized and climate optimized. And um, the average, and of course there were some young teams that didn't have as much experience as the others, but on average it was like 2.4% additional cost. And at that point the developer said like, hey, I cannot afford not to do this. This is crazy, this is not even contingency, right? So that led to some incredibly courageous policymakers like Ian Finlayson saying like, okay, I know there is legal trouble when you like, like incorporate like proprietary systems into the code, but we're gonna do it anyway. We're up against the wall with our like climate action plan, we have no better idea, let's go. So. For multifamily, that worked out okay. So they are basically now requiring uh, for every building that is larger than 12,000 square feet, multifamily building, that it meets passive house standards. Okay, we still have to work on the term, but you get the idea. So, and this is my warning sign that I need to speed up a little. A um, Couple of cool things that are starting to happen. Some 
really big developments. Uh, the mayor of Boston is super excited. Uh, Boston did uh, adopt the stretch in. They're not starting on the 1st of July, like uh, I believe like Cambridge, Somerville, Newton, they've started already like on the 1st of July. Boston will start on the 1st of January in 2024. And based on our like quick kind of statistical overview of how many multifamily projects are coming out of Massachusetts in a year, we're expecting about 100 large scale multifamily projects out of Mass alone in the next year. And there are a couple of firms in Massachusetts, I have to say, like, unbelievable, like uh, Peterson Engineering, they figured out how to vertically integrate the delivery of the process that I just described. And it's like a well-oiled machine now. They, they are doing like, how many are you doing, 40 or something like this? Crazy talk. Um, so if anybody had asked me 10 years ago, tell me what's going to happen, I would have probably been crazy enough, like, oh, your yeah, passive house will be cold, like, never believing that we get there. It's like, whoops, it happened. So pretty cool stuff, exciting. Uh, federal incentives, there's a whole bunch of stuff cooking, right? Like with the IRA, uh, FIAS, because of its partnership with Zero Energy Ready Home, also qualifies for the 5K, for single family or like for the units for, for multifamily. And then there's, of course, also the um, 179D for commercial, the tax, um, uh, the tax deduction. So then while like all that stuff in the IRA is happening, like HUD is like, we want in too. <laughs> and uh, they come out with this uh, new program, uh, which we call GRIP, or, we call GRIP or something, what, I don't know, whatever. Um, they have a leading edge award, they have like, ungodly amounts of money. So if you're an affordable housing developer, uh, you can actually, like if you commit to zero energy, um, passive, or I think they also allow lead, uh, lead zero and ILFI zero, um, then you qualify for that money. So really, really pretty awesome. And uh, we are actually working with a group of affordable developers who have never done it before, who are like maybe a little bit afraid. So we're trying to convene them and coach them through the pro uh, uh, process because it is hard. If you've never done it before, it is really, really difficult, right? And then uh, Julie, <laughs> you have been kicking ass. You've been building these all over the country, Washington DC, Chicago, Boston, and now you're onto the next challenge. Apparently you need challenges. I might be able to deliver a couple more. Um, if you run out of excitement. Um, exterior retrofit. Uh, this is uh, uh, the uh, preservation of affordable housing group that is doing this. Uh, fantastic work. And uh, on the commercial side, there's uh, also exciting stuff cooking. So we have ASHRAE 227P, P uh, as in it is a secret. <laughs> Not many people know about it yet. Well, can I? Working our way forward, uh, Graham Wright is also involved in that one. And um, so that will be an ANSI standard. Code, um, we're working on that with ASHRAE, obviously. And um, if and when that comes out, it'll be ready for any jurisdiction to adopt. And we hope that that will be the pathway for and actually power all of this. Like, we, we don't want to stay in there, like, as fears. Like, so it's essentially. Uh, a collaborative standard that has been developed by all passive house groups, or people who were active in it, trying under the ASHRAE umbrella, finding a consensus passive building standard. So very excited about this one. Hopefully in 2025 we'll have it. Uh, and then uh, in mass, uh, on this one they went a little bit further out there, uh, and I'm going to talk about the teddy here in a second. Um, they also came up with an idea for commercial buildings, how to kind of crank up the energy efficiency, uh, and FIA's uh, commercial core is also an alternative compliance path. So if the Teddy doesn't sound like too appealing to you, then you can also do FIA's. Okay, so a uh, couple um, case studies. Uh, our commercial certification has been on the ground for a while. Uh, we've built a whole bunch of those already, we've monitored, measured. <coughs> I just swallowed a fly, that's disgusting. <laughs> 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 
protein. Um, Microbiome. Yeah, right. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? All right. So this is a cool story. I mentioned Amory Levins earlier. Like somehow I became friends with him. And um, when I heard that he was building the Basalt new headquarters, I had been to his like original Snowmass headquarter place. Um, I was really excited. And I'm like, could we try out our climate specific standards on your building? And he's like, sure. I had like 70 like super experts and they did everything. They did the energy efficiency and they did the like cost optimization. This is, this is the the, this is the absolute sweet spot. I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so they had already designed it and all, done all the work, and we ran it through our model where like, it was spot on. And we certified it. So that put a giant smile on my face because, well, hey, we were successful, right? We actually canned what 70 experts put together for Amory in a short and do-it-yourself, essentially, um, design guideline. And here are the numbers. They are overproducing, they are feeding electric cars. This is truly the building of the future. It's CLT, by the way, uh, for our gentlemen from north of the border from the, from the Wood Council. Um, uh, great project. Uh, we have various zero energy uh, community centers in Illinois. Uh, and you can see it's not outrageous here. Uh, a retrofit, new construction, everything. Beautiful projects. As I said, the architects are starting to get inventive. And um, we also have high rises. So this is like a fantastic project. And it's not just fantastic because it's a high rise, but <laughs> because of what they did. Like, so look at these R values. This is an affordable high rise in the Bronx. Not outrageous. And they did all this, beautiful detailing and everything and quality assurance. Just figure I'd, I'd let you just quickly like take these details in. Um, just takes a little care, but it's doable. They have two. Uh, they're, they're coming from the bottom and from the top. They split the whole high-rise with the ventilation system. It's still centralized. We had the discussion here uh, with Coda. And they, the cost to run the building is, 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 is essentially a third of what the comparable code building would be. And they did all this. Oops. I don't know if you count it, but uh, the total additional cost, including quality assurance, was 2.4%. And then uh, this is, uh, we're also, we're, we're not standing still. We're also like working on the market rate developers. And um, I remember with Steve Bluestone, like many, many moons ago, we were in the headquarters, JP Morgan sustainability team. We tried to convince them that like this passive house stuff is a really cool thing and they, that they should finance this. Um, well, now it's here. The first design certified market rate project just started leasing in uh, Mount Vernon. New York. Okay, so predictions. We're getting to the interesting stuff, finally. Um, let's check time. Um, all right, so this is from the perspective of fears, right? Like This is still not like musings and not philosophy because I, I like to zoom out a little bit further than that once I'm done with this. But what I'm foreseeing is like, so the new standard setting framework, whichever one it will be, like the 227P or the Revive, will be code everywhere. Um, we will have more powerful, more accurate tools like the cloud-based energy modeling tool and many other like tools that will help us to do our jobs. Maybe artificial intelligence is scary, but maybe there's a place for it, right? Uh, we definitely need that continual commissioning process and we need to build it around a certification. Uh, that has to happen to make sure that our buildings actually perform the way we design them. I am going to make a really crazy prediction here. I think fossil fuels will go out of style. Um, because I'm, I'm a passive uh, activist. Um, <laughs> I'm learning, Joe. Like It only took me like 30 years in America to develop a sense of humor. Um, <laughs> um, so I think we, we will go back to our roots and we'll take a second look at thermal mass, uh, phase change, uh, new materials like the whitest paint, like cool as shit, right? Like some students like made paint that cools roofs like uh, into deep space at absolute zero. Don't ask me how that works. Um, and so really for me at the heart of passive has always been the ambient energy slash 
exergy, like the low-grade energy that we're all trying to tap into through like adjacent systems, like through synergies. I think there's still more to be done there. I think we can do better. Um, windows will become like awesome windows, just like Shercliffe said. They will become even awesomer, and uh, they'll be everywhere, and it will be cost-effective. Uh, we will have a breakthrough in the ventilation mechanical com combi or not combi, I don't care. Mechanical engineers kick into gear. This is our weakest point right now. Um, we need you. Uh, I was corrected by my team, my prediction of 1,000 plus units retrofitting uh, to these standards. Uh, I stand corrected. It should be more like 10,000 a day. Was that the number? Thank you. Uh, to retrofit our entire building stock in time. Uh, low load direct current building, so what Lisa is working on right now, I'm so excited about this. The microgrid plus like fierce level efficient like communities, that's the winner. We're doing research on this stuff. Ah, oh, it's to die for. So when I see that stuff, <laughs> I'm like, yes, we actually have a really good chance to make it here, yeah? So, um, and what also excites me is like, it, it democratizes energy and um, it empowers people and it makes people more safe with all the stuff that's coming at us. So it will make our grid safer, like if we can get there. Um, and buildings will become a central part of the energy generation infrastructure. And if you ask me in my other like parallel universe life, I would like to be a developer and I would like to make housing free for everyone because now this is my infrastructure cost. Yeah. All right, now the philosophy. I think I still have some minutes for the philosophy. Um, post log. I don't know, I don't even know if that word exists, but I made it up. Um, personal musings and observations. I want to write that passive house murder mystery novel. Uh, dead bodies in the walls. The detective accidentally, because he or she happened to have like an app, uh, finds this body in the wall and starts to try to unravel whatever's going on. All right, so that's my house. There's a body in the wall. There are still some challenges and mysteries to uncover. <laughs> uh, there are some mysteries, real life mysteries that are actually happening. These are two houses in Washington, DC. Uh, I came across this article and uh, I was like, oh no, I hope this is not like passive houses or anything. This is like my absolute nightmare, right? Like couple projects, couple idiots do stupid shit don't do stupid stuff, uh, houses melt away and we get a black eye. I was like, I'm like, oh no, now it's happening. Um, and it was actually blue, uh, Blueprint Robotics who made the walls and these things were advertised as um, the perfect homes, no mistakes, because robots made them. <laughs> well, it turns out people still have to put the panels together. It wasn't the panels, it was the idiots who put them together and had no idea about like hydrothermal. Apparently these things started leaking like a skiff, like the, the roof set leaks, like the systems weren't working. It was a, literally a nightmare. I, I, I invite you to find this article. It's a, it's a story what's coming at us if we're not good at what we do. And if I think about retrofitting and mold problems and existing buildings and the mistakes that already have been made, it's just like massive, okay? If I go there, I get depressed. So let's stay with the positive stories. Let's talk about Teddy. Um, Probably the depiction already kind of tells you what I think of the concept. <coughs> There's the Canadian teddy up north with like scarf and sweater. And the more racy kind of, uh, let's, let's drive around in a Porsche Massachusetts teddy. <laughs> um, no, but seriously. Um, so this is, I believe, an example of where people really want to do the right thing but they got a little bit carried away. And with great power comes great responsibility, right? So let's be careful with what we're putting in place. Um, if you look at like the Teddy that has been written into code in Massachusetts, and as I mentioned earlier, this is one of these experiments where somebody wrote something, probably didn't really know the context, used tools that were not made for the job, added more complexity to it, came up with one set of numbers. We, we heard this before, right? Like one size fits all, right? Um, and they didn't test, they didn't peer review. And now we 
are a little bit in trouble. We have five minutes and I'm wrapping up. <coughs> As you can see, on the other side, that like so these are the fierce built numbers uh, of four commercial buildings. These are fairly small buildings and you can also see that here the cooling is smaller than the heating in the different climate zones. Once the buildings get bigger, as our calculator shows on the left, this is a really big building, 50,000 uh, 50, square feet uh, envelope area, the cooling starts to outpace the heating. So what is our design problem in a big internal load driven building? Come on, you all design these. Cooling. So um, the 20 is the baseline building. I've seen the modeling and a little bit worse than the baseline building. But we're crushing the heating load. And we did so by making the requirement for the facade system really hard and really super insulated. What do we do? We created a total that is almost twice as the totals if you total our fierce targets, which we actually peer reviewed, tested, and have data for. So I recommend <laughs> that um, maybe those targets should be revisited, or maybe we tread lightly on them until we have 227P because that will hopefully take care of these things. All right, and that's why I'm gonna hold it. And I'm gonna be around, so if you wanna talk Teddy later, I'm, I'm here. Uh, Lisa White talks in a blog post about how, why this is so incredibly important that we get the targets right. She's very polite, she should be an honorary Canadian. Uh, <laughs> she says it uh, might lead to issues such as overheating and discomfort. Uh, I would say like, don't do stupid stuff. Okay, anyway, um, concluding remarks. Uh, the little uh, yellow tip there in this funnel diagram, that's the passive building principles. We had them in common the entire time. That's building science. And we've done multiple loopy things around this thing. We've tried things and like discarded things. And, and, and our understanding is expanding. And it has to expand because now we're trying to like wrap the whole carbon thing into this thing. And what we're doing is like we're creating models, tools that help us manage complexity. And to do that right, we need to know what our boundary conditions are for the experiment that we're trying to conduct and for the goals that we want to achieve and the problems we want to solve. We must solve. So Einstein, favorite quote, said, the models that we make, we make them to help us understand the complexities. When the models become authoritative over us and we forgot why we made them, this is when we need to make new models. So and with that, I'm kind of going to conclude, oh, well, I have Oliver Drerov's quote, I almost forgot all of them. He said it so well, I can't say it any better. I'm going to read it. We spend our young lives contributing to the myth. We then invest our time as mature builders debunking. We move from tool use and personnel management to systems understanding. In different words, what Einstein just said, and what I was trying to tell you with this presentation. Um, this was an unsolicited piece of wisdom that he sent me, uh, and I'm like, Oliver, can I use this? You will not be there, but in spirit, maybe you're there. And then last but not least, uh, Mark Bomberg commented on a post on Facebook that I uh, posted. I started with a safety rope up the mountain. This is like where I was clinging to like this one doctrine. Like I'm like, and it taught me a lot. It absolutely taught me a lot. I, I worked my way up, up through this funnel, right? Now I'm feeling like this. I, I learned my notes and I can now forget them. So um, this is going to be my kind of like vision of the next 10 years. And this is my retirement slide. <laughs> Just kidding. Not old enough, not wise enough. I'll see you on the dance floor. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to dance. Thank you for a magnificent presentation and you're welcome forever. <laughs>